I'm studying these problems deeply. I'm diving to the wrist into the the darkest parts of America and to the lightest parts, and I want to, you know, show people and teach people their own narrative because these narratives determine what we can do. And there is a narrative that exists. People just haven't read it. They just don't know about it because our schools were bad and stuff. They haven't taught them to love one. They haven't taught them the great democratic inheritance that we have in America and in the world. But like, this place is awesome. <laughs> America is so great. It's so great. And it's also really fucking up and it's been fucking up for a long time. Um, and only by loving it so much can you really deal with those things. Um, and, and, but I believe that all the materials we need are there. We have the internet, we have the people, we have the, the need, we have all these ingredients. We just need these catalysts to start things moving. And I wanna help be that catalyst. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are on site at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, in the beautiful Cambridge, Massachusetts. We are now going to be talking about the great American novel. We have Aiden Fitzsimons joining us on the show. Hello. Hello, Alan. Thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I'm super pumped. Aiden and I have been talking so much prior to this interview. He's a philosopher, writer, and synthesizer focused on the great American novel, which puts together all of the most important ideas from American poetry, philosophy, literature, history, and thought. And you can check out Aiden's links below. Aiden, let's start things off with our question. What is your current take on the state of our world? Um, asymmetrical and hollowed out. Um, so by what I mean by that is um, his, his history doesn't progress like in, uh, perfectly, right? Like the, 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 the mean of every dice roll isn't, doesn't happen every time. So there's all these imperfections, there's all these things that get stuck. Humans are such like a a fallen, you know, species. Like there's something uh, both perfect, striving and, and imperfect in us. And so our world for the last, I'd say since the 60s, um, when was the last time we saw sort of like a, a true like flood of consciousness of people trying to be aware of the structures around them that made them who they are and started wanting to like, you know, uh, expand uh, beyond them and create new structures. Um, they sort of lost, right? They lost. Uh, RFK was shot. Nixon, MLK was shot. Nixon won. Reagan won. Clinton won. Bush won. Like th these, uh, these. It's, it's been the same story for the past six years. It's the victory of capital. It's uh, you know the Cold War. Both sides lean into their own. Lean into themselves. Lean into their ego. Like you know what I mean. So communism gets a character of itself, and capitalism in, re in response to the USA becomes a character of itself. And we've been still living in that paradigm that they that the baby boomers sold out and created. We think of the baby boomers as the 60s like hippies, but that was like a small percentage of them. Most of them sold out from the beginning, and the rest sold out as time went on. Um, and the, the you know Gen X and the, at least the first half of the millennials <laughs> um, ha, have sort of you know inherited that world, that, that paradigm. There hasn't been any change. No one's no one's escaped. We've been seeing less and less sort of fewer or fewer and fewer of these like you know, people who, who push us outside. Um, and so what we have now is this culture that um, has sort of never known anything but this sort of consumerism, this sort of hollow, this idea that it's the end of history, this idea that, this idea that we live in a world that's done with history. History was World War II and those easily narrativ narrativizable things. I mean, in my US history class in my public school, like we never got past Watergate. Like we didn't learn anything past them. Like you, we, we just don't know the history of the world that's created us, that we're born into. We, we come into here totally oblivious and because of like our affluence, which is hollowing out, right? Like, like money versus like creation is a very different thing, right? Like um, we've been able to sort of sit back on ourselves for a while and like let inertia sort of ossify, things hollow from the inside because we can and we don't have to, we don't, we don't have, the adversity is not immediate and obvious to us so we can kind of, you know, push it off the way the baby boomers taught us to do and just ignore it all. And, uh, I think it's getting the rot is starting to show, and you know things like things like Trump, like um, and things like uh, just the, all the conflicts around the world, the way that social media is being used. You can tell that, like the very fact that like the internet's happened, so full communication, you know, is almost possible. And instead of like achieving, you know, collective excellence together, uh, all of our like weaknesses are being amplified. Um, it just shows that I guess. Another reason I say hollow is because our technology has outstripped our morality. Um, 
Martin Luther King has a quote about like that, but it's just like a general thought people have had for a long time. Um, you know, especially post World War II, post like military industrial complex money, post the rationalization of the university and uh, uh, all these things. We have a world where people, we, we have a world created by the great minds and the great inventions, the great thoughts of everyone who's came before us. But then we, their inheritors, who inherit this big, you know, cyborg we're all operating, you know, like together. We, 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 we never read the driver, like we, we haven't read the driver's manual. We haven't learned from the great people from our past. We, do, we haven't had to and haven't realized that we have to. Um, so I think we're hollow. And I also think we're asymmetrical in the sense that like, uh, right now capital's kind of just digging in, right? Like capital, like, like money and power has been this big sift for a while. Like, um, you ever see the elephant chart? You ever see the elephant chart? Um, People feeling different parts of the elephant and saying that they're seeing different things? No, no, the elephant chart is um, a chart of uh, world economic growth in the last like 50 years, right? And like percentage of growth. So, so it's an, imagine an elephant, right? So like hump and then, so like, it's like big, big hump and then a big dip for the trunk and then the, and then the tip of the trunk. So like people in like, uh, you know, developed economies like India and China is this big, big back of the trunk, like these huge growth in the last 50 years. And then uh, the very, the trunk, the, 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 the tip, the tail is like the you know, global like 1%, 0.1%. But then the dip, the big dip, like near 0%, like people whose lives like haven't gotten like in a relative sense better since like the like 70s, 80s is like the former like NATO middle class essentially. Um, we're just been hauled out. We're, we're seeing all sorts of, you know, effects from that now. Um, and so capitals, and, and, and so people are starting to realize, but also money and power have so many, you know, avenues which to, which to have power over us, the culture industry, like the way they can set all of our narratives, make us sort of blind to the things that need to be done. Um, so we're, we're right now seeing now is also this asymmetrical digging in. Fox News is another example um, to preserve power when its basis is being hollowed out by the day. Same with our big Dow numbers. <laughs> like, they, they, we, when we create measures, right, for an economy, um, once we create standards and measures and tests, we're gonna start doing whatever we can to pass that test, whether or not we retain the actual virtues and goals that were there to begin with. So once we make the Dow or like the, the uh, Wall Street numbers like the measure of the economy as a whole, we start like leaning into that way and trying to pass the test by any means necessary without maybe showing the same underlying values that once made that test valuable. So that was a long ramble, but. <laughs> you can tell that Aiden is a synthesizer. <laughs> yeah, I definitely think in broad strokes. And, and, and not super accurately too, I'm just, you know, I don't want to like lay 100% claim to anything I say in a sense, like I, we I'm We stand on the truth. shoulders of giants. Oh, very much so, we and are, we are know those. that, totally know that, and you gave so many excellent examples throughout history, through the use of technology. I loved the, even on the global scale, the idea of this elephant, and that's a really good way of displaying people that have been just taken out of what is just a couple dollar a day of income to a couple of tens of dollars, if not even a hundred dollar a day of income compared to people that you, you used to make a hundred dollar a day income that have stayed in a hundred dollar a day income. Yes. And then the very end of the tail of the trunk, which is just the skyrocketing. <laughs> sort of forces the companies and the... Yeah, that's 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 a really good one, and also just your your overall idea of of the the code that society has been pushing forth since really the industrial revolution has been about this number of the economy and the number of making civilization better, which we have in many ways eradicated a lot of disease and issues, increased longevity, mm -hmm. increased the quality of living with a lot of access to information technology and this type of stuff's great. Oh, yes. Simultaneously, our spiritual actualization and transcendence and guide towards unity and cohesion and planetary harmony with nature and our ecosystem that we reside in has taken a back seat to the numbers of GDP and Absolutely. the Dow. Global so, warming, like I mean, or climate change, what, you know, that as an example of uh, the effects of that. Yeah, so you can tell Aiden's obviously just on f absolute fire with <laughs> with this, and I'm I'm really glad I'm really glad that that was the you know that was a really powerful state of the world. Uh, another way to 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 
put it as you initially said, is that what happened to MLK, what happened to JFK, what happened to Lenin, what happened to a lot of these leaders around the world that wanted a deeper drive towards peace and harmony. Uh, and unfortunately, there seem to be uh, potentially forces that work together to make sure that that did not uh, come to be. Yes. And uh, why has it been that, uh, that, that Libya, Iraq, and Afghanistan uh, were potentially some of the targets for centralized banking to be implemented. Interesting. Yeah, and why are Iran and uh, North Korea some of the last ones, and uh, why are they uh, targets as well now? And what does uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain technology mean for all of this? And uh, and there's a, there's a lot more to, to unpack with you. And I'm sure you have perspectives on all of uh, what I just said. Sure. And we could probably talk for like ever on all of this. And let's go, let's, let's jump because let's jump. There's still so much to talk about. Let's, let's <laughs> jump. I, I moved the chip, I moved it back. Yeah, yeah, you're good, you're good. You're still, in, you're still in frame. So let's jump into the journey. So I'm born near Providence in Rhode Island in the United States in the Northeast corner. And you, as a kid, you didn't travel too much, but you somehow managed to get hooked into being some good enough of a student to end up getting into Harvard. Yes. So teach us about you growing up as a kid and how that even happened. Okay. Um, uh, growing up as a kid, I uh, grew up in Swansea, Massachusetts, which is right over the border from Providence. This whole crazy colonial history as to why Swansea is part of Massachusetts, which it shouldn't be, it should be part of Rhode Island. Um, well, in, in Plymouth Colony, that doesn't exist anymore. Um, but I love my hometown very much. Like, I love the, the, the water of like, the Narragansett Bay is definitely like in, in me. Um, so I'm like, Massachusetts and Boston, but I'm also Rhode Island. And I have a little sister, a little sister. I have two parents. Uh, my mom is very like social and bubbly and like just a, a saint and like a go-getter. And like she, a uh, very good person. And she uh, helps like English as a second language and, uh, and uh, first generation low income kids get acclimated to UMass Dartmouth, the University of Massachusetts in the south, where near New Bedford and Fall River, the city next to is. Um, and they're pretty like uh, they're pretty poor communities, so we have a, like that's a huge population of UMass Dartmouth. Um, and then my dad uh, is like a historian. Um, he teaches like occasionally at Rhode Island School of Design, like teach like a Vietnam War films class and stuff. Um, but he was like the sort of stay at home dad. Uh, growing up, um, and so and he and he and he and he's like a, he's, he's brilliant. He's really brilliant. So him being my dad growing up definitely helped make me who I am. Um, same with my sister. I guess she, my sister's much more like him. I'm more like my mom. Um, but so they raised me. And uh, when I was little, I'd say I'm going to go to Harvard. Like I heard it's a pretty good school, you know, like. Because uh, I was, you know, that full of myself and then <laughs> believed in my own intelligence that much. And then as like middle school, then I skipped a grade, and then like, and then so then I went to middle school. And I sort of forgot about that. Um, left behind, try to sort of like figure out how to be a person, how to like socialize, how to like. Uh, skipping a grade definitely had a big imp impact on me. So I had to like socialize with in, in this small public school where everyone's known each other for, you know, their whole lives in the same grade together. Um, and. So that definitely impacted me. And then I was in theater. I was an actor for the longest time. So I'm, I'm definitely still like an actor in my blood. Like uh, acting has informed my life in a lot of ways. Um, I think acting is a very important way, of, uh, important aspect of being in general, of being a person. Um, I think in a, as I said, everything is acting. And not in a false way, but in a true way, everything is acting. Um, and then, and then I, uh, and then like by the time I was at sophomore summer of high school, I was like starting to get like kind of uh, just have a rough time with my parents and have a rough time like in my like life in general. And I came out that summer with this burning dream that I was gonna prove myself. I was gonna go to Harvard. I was gonna get you know. I in my high school like uh, the local community college was sort of like the standard slash the height. Uh, and so it wasn't like a it wasn't like a plausible thing though. It wasn't like tossed around. It wasn't like talked about, there weren't the guidance counselors who knew anything about anything. Um, so I had to sort of do it myself. I had to sort of do it myself. But I was really determined, and I really thought I could do it. 
and I, and I was and I figured like I might as well, you know, try my very hardest and believe that I can. And that's the best chance I have that, that I'd have, you know. And then if I fail, it's like at least try my best. Um, and so I applied Harvard Early Action. I got in, and it was like the best day of my life. Like you know what I mean? Like wow, <laughs> Harvard, it's crazy. And I'm still very grateful for it. I still walk around like so grateful. Um, I don't take any of it for granted. What um, were the things that you did uh, in the from sophomore year to senior year that of you, high school that you think got you the ticket in? Um, uh, besides like doing like extracurriculars and you know being like president of the drama company and and doing like a show choir and, and doing all this historical volunteering at the local a few local muse museums and, and uh, like in Fall River and there's also like there was also like a colonial museum in my hometown that I worked for. Um, and uh, it was my essays. It was my essays that got me in, though. I mean, my grades were all, you know, in my, in, my, in my SAT subject tests and all blah, blah, blah. Like, all the scores were perfect and stuff. But, uh, you know, they didn't need another, like, of that. But, they, but, but my essays were unique. My essays were why I got in. I'm 100% sure. I haven't, checked, I haven't checked my files or anything. But my essays were really good, and that was why I got what in. What did you write about? So for my Common App essay, they were both Harvard's Harvard's reaction. It was, like, one for one. But the Common App essay was, like, very, like, well written, dramatic. It was about theater and socialization and my like my life, and it was more it was more tragic and like, but also hopeful and and, and powerful and like, well written and about like me becoming a person. And then my Harvard supplement was a satire about the Iron Knight, who was me, uh, on his quest to, be, uh, to to like be better than all the like the, there's like there's like these like silver and golden knights, you know, like with their squires shining their armor. And it was in this quest to go to the king, the dean of admissions. Um, and ask him and, and convince him to allow me to marry his daughter, the princess, Harvard. Um, and I sort of just, it's, it's very funny, A, eh? so it was like a really like funny piece. I even made an incest joke about the Dean of Admissions because his name was Dean William Fitzsimmons. And so like, I have one less M than him, but I made like an incest joke, about, and I made it a Yale joke too. Um, and it was just wicked funny. And, uh, and then it ended with like, this little sincere speech, like, a, like purposefully and truthfully like sincere and naive speech. Sort of like, yeah, I know, like, there's all these awesome knights. They're like all kingdom jousters and shit, and like, they're great. But I, I and like, I, I talked, about, talked about myself, and just, uh, I, I can't, um, you know, I can't, like, swear any of these things to you. All I can say is that, A, like, trying to win your princess, trying to, trying to uh, make myself better to be worth this, Harvard has made me better. This journey, this dream, having this dream that I worked so hard for has made me better. So I thank you, you know, I just thank you for, even if I don't get in, like, or even, even, even if I can't marry her, like, I thank you for that. And be like, I just uh, uh, can't even begin to imagine the amazing things that we could do together, she and I. Um, and it was just very sincere and like yeah, yeah. youthful and heartfelt. Plus the, 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 uh, the joke about the dean and incest probably like got like a, like the, the reader was probably like, ha, Bill, get in here. Like, <laughs> so they probably get my name look a little more remembered. Um, so yeah. Okay, cool. That's, that's, good. that's good on you for writing a very strong essay. And what was it called? An, the addition to the essay? The, the Iron Knight or the? Yeah, but the Iron Knight's called a, what is it called in addition to the essay? The Common App essay? Oh, it was the Harvard the, Supplement. It was the Harvard the Supplement, supplement. essay. Supplement, yeah. Yeah, okay, so cool. write whatever you want for Harvard. Cool, cool, yeah, yeah. So the Supplement essay plus all of the, um, the leadership and the extracurriculars and, the, and the, uh, the excellent grades and test scores. Okay, cool, cool. So then, all right, so you have this profound moment of the, oh my gosh, I'm in Harvard, holy cow. All right, what is it like landing here in 2016 in the Harvard um, Zoo? So I, uh, on one hand, I was very, you know, surreal and excited and grateful. Like, I was meeting awesome people, making friends. But on the other hand, I was pretty disillusioned uh, very fast. Um, Harvard, while being the, one of the best places on earth, was also, because it, it's not using its power very well, it's, um, it too is hollowed, it too is like sort of um, and lack of a large, large, lot of larger problems in society. And, you can, and the problem with Harvard is you can see it happening around you. You can imagine like, okay, 50% of my classmates are going into like consulting and finance and going to reify power structures and they're not, and, they're, and they're, they, they got here because these various existential lottery factors of like these parents, this neighborhood, this school system, this upper middle class way of like life and moving through a system. The, I guess, uh, um, you just imagine like if everyone every year is like this across all the other, across Princeton, Chicago, Stanford, if everyone's like this, 
what are we gonna do? <laughs> like, has everyone been like this for the past 15 years? Because a lot of things about the world today would make a lot of sense if, like, if the leaders of the world have been like all like this. Because they're all just like, they're smart in a system following way. They're, they're good at following the obvious cheese, you know? Whereas like, uh, like, like, like Nietzsche would have torn his hair out, you know? Like, <laughs> like um, there's, there's, the more important intelligence is to like, break out of the systems you're in, to transcend, to, to, to recombine, to, to subvert. Um, and no one's doing it. I just expected to get there and to be surrounded by like, way, like brilliant people in different ways who would all teach me something new and we'd all get excited talking until the wee hours and we'd synthesize and we'd try to save the world together. Um, and then like, that, that wasn't really happening. And then Trump got elected and I was, I mean everyone was shocked, everyone was, had some personal reaction to it. But peop people moved on with life as usual really fast. And I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, the, it, Trump being elected is just like, it's so much deeper than just a political problem or just like a this problem or that problem. It's, it's the common, it's like, it's all of the problems that we haven't dealt with as a culture, as a civilization, as a world, as a country, as a, as human, as individuals for, for, forever. We, the, the, all the things we've pushed off are still here and we still haven't dealt with them. His, the history that makes us is still unfinished. It's still flawed. There's, there, is, there are sins in us as well as successes. Um, and we haven't dealt with all of them and we can. You know, we have all the people, we have all the, every idea that exists is part of the interconnected whole. So we just have to take more of those holes in to fix the other parts. There's no, you know, there's no discontinuity. Uh, so, so we just have to dig and try harder as like a culture and as people, and we just aren't. Um, and so it's a deep cultural problem and I decided I w wanted to go crazy because I, I felt like people weren't crazy enough uh, and I wanted to be crazier, so I... Quick on the way there. Okay, okay. <laughs> yes, because I must say that you paint this beautiful uh, visual of what potentially is old code propagating old without, code, yes. without new code intervention. Ah. And so when we get too deep into these measurements that we were initially talking about at the beginning yeah. of GDP and the Dow, and you go into the same, follow the cheese the same yeah. way. These that, hardened ruts, these contours. Yes, when, when the new code doesn't have space to breathe to be deployed into the world due to the economic machinery that's constantly going, that it requires some sort of a crazy code deployment, kind of like what we saw with whatever Satoshi Nakamoto and blockchain technology is, in order for kind of the world in a sense to start getting flipped over on its head and so for the new code to actually get deployed. And I think that we need to give more breathing space for new code to come in to be able to tackle some of these problems. And so your vis your, the way that you illustrated, if, if, it, if this is right, potentially, Europe, Asia, the United States, all these different places in the world, the, uh, these Ivy League uh, academic institutions, if the contours are that way towards the cheese, we're, in a sense, we're carving the problem for ourselves deeper as it just keeps deeper and as it keeps going. Yeah. So it's just well said. Thank you, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Um, so okay, so then uh, Trump and you're like, and you're like, wow, we need to tackle this. And you actually decided to tackle part of this yeah. yourself through a story. Yeah, the culture. Y yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, so I read On the Road by Jack Kerouac. He was like, beat generation. They, they drove around the country having adventures. They knew time, like we know time, Jack, we know time. This idea of like, as much muchness per second, like living life, like uh, very, very freeing. Reading that book was like a very freeing experience. And it's got plenty of flaws. It's, and it's, it's not my favorite book ever, but it's one of them. And it, uh, it inspired me to like, they also hitchhiked a little bit in the book. They mostly drove, but back in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, it was very normal to hitchhike. It was like, GIs would come home and hitchhike. It was a respectable normal thing to do because we already have cars, you know, we're already going somewhere. Yeah, come along with neighbor, come along friend. Um, whereas in this sort of victory of capital scenario that I described earlier, this like post Nixon, post Reagan, especially this, this fear, this digging in, this ego sort of conservative impulse, this sort of, uh, this closedness, this, this anti-liberalism, this anti-openness sort of impulse to like live in your own, you know, gated community and be afraid of what's on TV. Um, that narrative went over, the idea of like, the hitchhiker's a murderer and the person picking up a hitchhiker's a murderer. So everyone's a murderer and we can't trust one another. 
Um, and I think that's very related to our problems like politically today. The idea that we just like our countrymen, like my brother in, the, in Georgia isn't, isn't my brother. He's, to be, he's the other to be afraid of. Uh, and that's stupid. Everyone's people, you know? Everyone's people and people are good. Um, you know, 99%. <laughs> um, and we can't let like the 1% ruin that for us, you know? Um, and so I wanted to prove that there was still trust and still community and, and, and still things to be learned, adventure to be had. And so I decided to hitchhike around America the, the summer between freshman and sophomore year. And I did. I, I, you know, I saved up some money. I worked at a burrito bar for May and half of June. And then at the end of June, I set out my backpack and I uh, did a whole 8,000 mile, you know, loop-de-loop -loop around America. Saw all these national parks, saw these cities, these uh, the cultural areas. Talked to, you know, 180 drivers plus another couple hundred people on the streets of cities and, um, and couch surf people hosts and things like that. Uh, and I just like, I just had such profound effects on me. It changed me forever. I mean, I'll never, I'll never be the same. I'm, I'm going to go again this summer too. I mean, I, I can't resist anymore. I get, I get too antsy. I gotta, you know, I gotta go. There's the roads like right there. Like that same road touches San Francisco. <laughs> so yes. it's like, it's right there. Um, so yeah, adventure in America. And since then I've been, uh, you know, trying to write a novel about it, about the journey, using, using that journey and probably the journey I'm doing this summer um, as like the plot, as like, the basis for this, uh, you know, adventure story. Um, but use it as an excuse to sort of paint this mosaic of, of ideas and arguments and essences from America, like American thought, American history, American the best American philosophers, the greatest American novels, the greatest American poetry, the ideas that make America America. Not only the ideas that have, have existed, but the ideas that have been gestured towards, you know, the things that have been implied from day one, like all men are created equal, right? We've been always trying to get to there. We've been, we've been you know, um, there's all these ideals and there's all these problems too, these deep, deep, bad things to, to dig through too, but we have to. We have to dig all the way through them. We have to take them all in us. We, um, uh, Walt Whitman, who's like the most American person, he's, the, he's American culture, he's the American prophet, he's, he's expansive. He, he, in his uh, call for what the, the greatest poet will be, which is like a, himself, but also calling to the future, his like future followers, um, talks about how uh, America is like the greatest of poems, and it draws from every language and land. It draws all these. It's like the great synthesizer. You know, it's the great open vessel, the great open synthetic thing. Um, full honesty, full to, to to take in your time, like uh, to take in like the like the zeitgeist essentially uh, as as it, as a, as a, as like uh, like vast oceanic tides underneath you to to be your time, to be the voice that your t that comes through you after your time goes into you. Um, I guess I'm rambling a little bit. Um, <laughs> You're but, crushing uh, it. You're <laughs> doing so well. And the way that you talk, again, is just so evident of a, a really strong synthesizer. So what happens when you end up going and 180 different uh, hitchhike uh, drivers that you rode with, yeah. hundreds of people from different cities, probably different national 250, parks. Probably 250 rides now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and you're about to go on potentially more. Definitely. Uh, a lot of the greatest American novelists and poets also synthesis, synthesizing all of this together, thinkers, and it kind of produces you. Yeah. And so this is, it, it makes a lot of sense hearing you speak the way you do because in a more hollowed out world that's kind of following the same contours towards the cheese we're missing people like, yes like you and and i and i hope that the same way that we view people like alex k chen yeah. that introduced us that <laughs> yeah, shout, shout out, out shout out alex. that that we view people like you and him and myself as going in a way that is carving out a different contour. Yeah. And that that different contour uh, can lead other young people to follow their own yes. unique novel contours. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, my, 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 path, my, path is, my, my, my path is to try to open as many paths as possible for others. Um, that's definitely what I want to do um, with my, my book. The title, the title is, uh, is Beaten Path. B E A T I N apostrophe path. So it's the present. It's me. It's happening. It's the synthesis of all those past, past, and the bibliography of the book, which will itself be a conspectus of like the greatest of America. Uh, you know, as an idea. Um, of course, an incom incomplete conspectus, but but a good starting point nonetheless for. 
for anyone with this one book to sort of start their own journey through American thought and to be able to follow, to read Emerson or to read Toni Morrison, to, to bounce off uh, my journey, my path. And, and that bibliography is beaten paths, right? Like T-E-N past tense, plural paths. Uh, so it's this sort of, you know, the way the present combines at a point from, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so Aiden also decided that after he decides to take on this massive journey across the, the United States that he also is um, doing a lot of articles and poems and uh, getting involved in, in some writing on campus. Yeah. And, and you're now to the point where you're just kind of like, well maybe I need to compound my intelligence with absolute freedom. Yes. And so this is one of the things that I think is difficult for, for young people to make decisions on as well as the contour is already, you know, you've etched yourself three years of that path. Yes. And so for you to be able to say like, is, is, is me in my most awakened state? And you said, you know, in the 60s, we had potentially one of the greatest eruptions of awakening and consciousness that kind of, again, just fell back Failed, into yeah. the economic uh, machine that could it potentially be that young people after one year, two years, three years of school need to just kind of sometimes if they're really wanting to compound their intelligence outside of that academic institution system, need to pull the plug. Yes. And you're kind of considering that as potentially, you know, what you need to do to write the great American yes. novel. Um, yeah, I, uh, I've been toying with this for like a year now. Um, if I want to take time off. Um, because I, I'm so dedicated to this project, I, I've bought ferociously like all these books, right? I have hundred, like, uh, like I have so many books that are sitting there waiting to be read, that I'm very excited to read, that fit into this long web, this web of time that is, the, is like American ideas, right? Um, that, I, that the more I read, the more the picture clears stuff out, the more each indicates one another, the more these central dialogues, these central themes develop themselves. I can see who responds to who. I can see how Gene Toomer responds to Cormac Cor Cor McCarthy. I can see where Whitman and Emerson diverge and what that means for their followers after. You know what I mean? Like, um, and it's, it's intellectual. I'm, it makes me want to read all the time. Like my free time is reading, but it's reading what I want to read rather than my classes. And I, I've done well in my past two years to make all my classes, m a majority of my classes fit in with this project. But at this point, next year I have to write a thesis for social studies, which is my major. Um, which I don't feel ready to do. I'd rather focus entirely on this and get this project done first um, and really go all in on it um, rather than split myself up. And uh, I just feel at this point that s being in school is holding me back. I don't want, uh, you know, just as far as time pressure, systems, people to talk to, distractions, um, writing f and reading for a class rather than for me. I want to be able to make my novel a full time job that I wake up in the morning, read, write, read, write and hitchhike in, uh, for vacations and, and to be in that m mindset again. Because it's a very different mindset than school mindset. Just being on the road, at, like, uh, because your environment is so different, uh, it makes your mind very different. And it's way more philosophical. Uh, and I can't wait to get back to that state of mind. Um, and at this point, I just think that self-education will do better for me than being educated by Harvard, especially if I'm going to, like, even though I'm on like full financial aid, like paying to be there, like someone's paying me to be there, like why would I pay to be there when I could learn faster and better on my own for now? And then come back, sort of extend my Harvard time a little bit longer, you know, be able to like visit, I'll, I'll be able to meet more Harvard students and I make a lot of friends, very, I make a lot of friends because I, you know, I talk to people from trees and stuff and I like wander around, and I talk to strangers and I, today I talked to like five strangers. <laughs> it was sunny out, you know, I was like wandering. Uh, anyway. Um, so being at Harvard physically for more years, like more friends, definitely valuable to me. Also being able to like audit classes. I could just show up to lectures and learn. For me, learning is, I guess, I guess learning for me is much more about learning than it is about the degree. Even though I'll get the degree, which is why I know I'll be fun. And I'm not going to like die of starvation. You know, like I, I'd rather, th th this is what matters to me, is, is this project. And it feels urgent. I already feel, I, I, because I started this whole idea in like essentially like early 2017, um, I feel guilty that it wasn't ready for 2020. You know what I mean? Like I feel like responsible. Like I feel like if, 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 I, if, I, had a, if I had been more dedicated, maybe I could have done it faster. And at this point, I definitely want to have it done, done at least before the 2022 20, midterms. Um, yeah. 
Oh, man. Yeah, th so this is one of the things that we were chatting about a little beforehand off camera, too, is that this requires a good amount of calculus, of math, yes. of analyzing trajectory of life outcome. And for all of those that are watching that either are in school themselves or that have a family members or friends that are in school that are contemplating this, this is actually a very important question to ask. Where do you map your life trajectory if you are to just full time do what you love every single moment of every day? If you are as passionate as Aiden is, or if you just have some 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 true north that you really need to follow in this exact moment you with the mind that is you know 16 18 20 years old is just compounding the knowledge that you gain at 16 18 or 20 Absolutely. versus if you wait until you're 22 or 24 or 26 to go towards that true north so going at it as early as possible so critical so this is a very important thing to do math and calculus on this life trajectory but i'm really happy that you're voicing this because it's such a crucial topic for other people to to think about and have conversations about yeah i'm just grateful that you are that you have a true north that you can pursue yes. with this the fact that you have that and you're 20, 20. 20, and you're 20 and you have a true north that you can pursue like that, at least for now, once you finish it, you move on. And patience is a very important thing because oh, you're sure. gonna continue synthesizing information and it's just gonna keep getting better and better and better. But yeah. then yes, there does need to be some sort of a publication. Sometimes it's good yeah. to do I won't, I won't force it out though. I'll let, yeah, I'll let, I'll let the art important. dictate itself. Yeah, that's extremely important. And yeah. you can, I'd, rather, I'd rather get the Great American novel right in a timeless, yeah, correct, in a timeless sense. Correct, correct. And so it might take a little bit uh, longer than just waiting a year until 2020. But just also that, you know, you mentioned these funny things that, you know, that you, you are very eccentric in your behaviors. You know, you likely climb more trees than I do, but I definitely climb at least a tree a month or two. Hell yeah. And that's so important. <laughs> it's so, so important. important to do that. And it's, I, got, I got cuts and stuff. <laughs> yeah, from tree climbing, and it, it gives. There's so many important things that come with that. Not only does it feel like it's where we come from, but also it's uh, it's just a beautiful thing to be eccentric, be hanging out in a tree and just looking yeah. people watching slash talking to people. It's just a very fun thing. I want to hit on some of your thoughts around what's happening with. Uh, our ability to engage and inspire Generation Z. Yeah. So we have, like you mentioned at the beginning, that what's going on with millennials? Why has there been such a, uh, again, just following a very similar path into the economy rather than this uproar and this ability to and put deploy the new code in? Gen Z, on the other hand, is a lot younger. They've had technology growing up their whole lives. They're kind of technology experts in a sense of knowing what's happening at the cutting edge of the moment that it's happening. In, 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 a, fluid, in a fluid sense too. In a fluid sense, but especially in smartphone technology sure. versus potentially one that like, you know, Gen Z doesn't really, I guess, understand what's happening at the edge of synthetic biology, no, maybe no, you would say. So, no. so, the, so it's a kind of a different edge in a sense. But for them to be able to rally and engage and move forward on a subject, and I love your, your thought here with something that galvanizes them like this idea of water. Yes. So, yeah, so teach us about this. Okay. So, yeah, I think Gen Z is important. I think, I think, um, I, think I mean, of course, every generation is important, but I think because of the deterministic way that the world is, um, Generation Z, because, because media is an extension of our humanity, right? And because the way we can act is very much constrained and determined by the words and narratives that we have to act upon, the fact that uh, we weren't raised on cap like capital-owned t television, you know what I mean? Like our narrative, and the fact that, yes, we had the same shitty education as a, as a generation, we had the same shitty education that the past three generations have had, except probably even worse because we haven't, like, we, we, you know, the more the world changes, the more we keep things the same, the farther apart sort of they get. Um, we do have the internet. We had Wikipedia. We had the Wild West internet. We had like downloading illegal movies because we could. You know what I mean? Um, so I think that we have a very specific sort of way that like knowledge is ours in a way that uh, it wasn't before. And I think that um, Generation Z also, very realistically, like, because the future matters in a calculus, even, of course, we, we discount the future, but it's still, we also do count it. 
Like the idea that there's like high, high, super high rates of like anxiety and depression and stuff among the younger generation. Yes, it's part social media and yes, that's part uh, education system. But it's also part like a realistic response to like the shit storm <laughs> that's gonna come for uh, like for us for like like wet climate migration, all the various threats to existential life, um, the destabilization, all these things like they're ha gonna happen around us. So we have a huge responsibility. We have to clean up like three generations of putting things off. We have to like do a lot. We have to take a burden on our backs. Um, and we gotta be able to rise up, to, we gotta be ready for it. The wave has to be there, you know what I mean? We have to be there ready. So we need to start now trying wicked hard uh, to, to be ready to pr uh, prepare for those challenges. And that will require immense self-education among a large proportion of people. It will require a cultural change that values learning and, 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 and learning and acting in the world and trying to like, do things, make things better, no matter where what you are. It will require new ways of thinking about the individual's relationship to society and to the past and to the future. Um, it requires a lot of moral, personal, uh, even like religious change in the, in the way that we, uh, that we act in the world. And so with Generation Z, uh, well with the Great American Novel I'm trying to capitalize and get a platform, right? I, wanna, I want to, you know, the New York Times, when, the, when, when Kerouac wrote On the Road, right? The New York Times was a big thing like, this is what the kids are up to, this is the beat generation. They love that, they love to like define new generations. Um, and I want to use that tendency to get a foothold, to get a platform and then use it to say radically different things than what old people are saying because I'm like young and smart and have these things to say and I'm studying these problems deeply. I'm diving to the wrist into the, the darkest parts of America and to the lightest parts and I wanna you know, show people and teach people their own narrative because these narratives determine what we can do. And there is a narrative that exists. People just haven't read it. They just don't know about it because our schools were bad and stuff. They haven't taught them to love learning. They haven't taught them the great democratic inheritance that we have in America and in the world. But like, this place is awesome. <laughs> America's so great, it's so great. And it's also really fucking up and it's been fucking up for a long time. Um, and only by loving it so much can you really deal with those things. Um, and, and, but I believe that all the materials we need are there. We have the internet, we have the people, we have the, the need, we have all these ingredients. We just need these catalysts to start things moving. I want to help be that catalyst. I want to help not only like help connect people in Gen Z like, uh, like the way that you do and the way that Alex does, uh, but I also want to inspire them. I want to start dialogues. I want to inspire other people to do their own crazy thing. Whatever they're hitchhiking around the country is, do that thing. You know what I mean? Like not everyone's going to hitchhike. It's scary, uh, but but everyone has a thing, a crazy thing they can do, and I want everyone to start doing that because we need people to do that. We need we need hail marys at this point, like, just with climate change alone. Um, and so I want to help inspire that, and I want to try to use. I want to try to get a platform and then leverage it in ways that can sort of help start movements. There's some activist movements I have in mind just for America alone. Like I have this whole idea that like after college I'd love to do like a like a, a new American Lyceum. Uh, this is a quick diversion, but the Lyceum movement was the uh, 1800s. There's also the really like Chautauqua movement, which are these self educated these adult education movements in early America. So people like Ralph Waldo Emerson would go from town to town to the town hall, and it'd be a big town event, and he'd give his lecture and teach them stuff, and I'd, and then. There's the Freedom Bus Rides in the 60s, the Civil Rights Movement, 50s, 60s, Civil Rights Movement, um, 50s, I guess, first. The Freedom Riders who would like willingly go to these places to like be like, hi, like segregation's bad. Um, and I want to combine those ideas and, to, and basically get a bunch of like smart kids into some school buses, which you can like mod out to live in, uh, about like a half dozen people, and drive around the country and teach people about things. <laughs> and, like, have, and start discussions and have like videos of it. That's a side idea, but well, I'll, I, I'm just thinking like I want a platform, and I'll, then I'll use it very well. I'm going to use a platform very well um, if I get it. Um, and you mentioned water, uh, so part of this whole Gen Z thing I'm trying to do is the idea of like a water religion. Um, so I study social theory at Harvard. That's like my thing, or that's like my major technically. Um, probably should be English looking back on it, but it's too late now. Or Histon Lit. But social studies is great. I love social theory. I love philosophy. Um, and one of the big sort of themes that's emerged in my study of social theory is the A, how fundamental the like religious impulse. Uh, Emil Durkheim's Elementary Forms of Religious Life, amazing book. It basically talks about how sociality itself, religion, our, our need to like all, you know, be a, be a part of a tribe, be a part of a society, is like this religious force, this collective effervescence, this connective force, um, and how that makes us who we are. And People like Max Weber and, and, and the Frankfurt School, these sort of more depressing social theorists coming out of mainly Germany, and like 
the late 1800s, early 1900s, they all talked about how rationalization was like destroying, like evacuating meaning from society, right? Like killing religion, making things meaningless. Um, and that, they were like a big, they were very afraid of that. Um, and I, there's a lot of calls for a new kind of religion from Durkheim, also from people uh, the modern day, like Roberto Unger, a philosopher, a very interesting philosopher who's still teaching at Harvard. Um, Roberto Unger, who wrote the, the religion of the future. There also, Emil Durkheim had a, uh, call for like a, a, a religion of individualism. So the only thing that connects us is how different we are, you know. Uh, the way that religion and, and democratic liberalism co coalesce. And also Walt Whitman and his Democratic Vistas, which is like his big essay on like the essence of democracy. Um, it's brilliant. Um, in Demo Democratic Vistas, he, t he, he wanted to realize a democracy, democracy is a way deeper idea than just a political system. Democracy is like a way of life. It's like a, it's a way of conceptualizing the world. It's, it, it's, Intersubjective and social and full of love and full of like, and, and it requires full like it, it, it's it's the mediation of the individual and society which is this the problem that's gone all the way back right how to mediate individual and society, um, and democracy is like the one that maximizes that understanding that the individual needs society to grow and the and the society needs the individual to like be free and full sort of realize its sort of like liberal potential in order to contribute back to society um, and democracy like. Uh, uh, Whitman talks about how he wants to start a religion of democracy, like a, a, de a, democra a democratic religion that's based on like love and sort of. Uh, uh, anyway, this call's been here for a while. There's, there's a there's a there's a need. There's a narrative about it. There's this calls for it, um, and I think water as is like a very tangible, real symbol to project these ideas onto and use to create a religion. Um, water religion. Uh, would uh, would first of all be very individualized, so you we, everyone can have their own version of it. We all drink water, so it has a commonality, but also we're all made up of water. We're all made up of water, yes. Um, but you can project your own meanings onto it. The only sort of requirement would be like yes, to be conscious every time you drink water, every time you take a shower, or sit, hear the rain, or whatever, just to like actively be conscious of that water, to be like thank you water, to think of the civilization, the use civilization of pipes that brought that water to you, to think of the cycle of water from the oceans to the rivers to the through the mountains into the deer into you into the ground into the grass into the ground again into you um, to think of yourself as water and everyone around you as water to, to try to see the water in them to see the same you know blue aura in their veins that you have um, to sort of just feel connected because religions need a connection to a larger whole a sense of belonging that's that societal thing society uh, God the idea of God is basically just society um, that the, con the the consciousness that we come from a larger whole that determines us, that we're somehow a part of, but also subordinate to and smaller than, but also owe ourselves to. Um, water is that, but it extends beyond our tribe to all life. So water religion, I think, would A, help deal with global warming, just warming just in a sort of consciousness way. Um, it also um, uh, has rituals. It's the only ritual besides, like, you know, breathing that we all perform. It's the only like, ritual, and, and religion needs rituals to solidify it. Um, it kind of combines like Confucianism and Taoism, these two different threads of Chinese thought, in a way that's kind of hard to explain. Uh, we talked about contours earlier, it's like contours and the water. It's kind of both, because um, uh, deliberate action and non-action. Um, and water it refreshes us, right? It's like a reset. It's like made anew. It's youth. It's it's life. Like the, all the religions. So Christianity uses water for like life, right? Like. Um, uh, and all the major world, world religions have some sort of water symbolism involved, some sort of water ritual involved, whether it's the washing of the hands, or the purification of something, or a, a rain dance. You know, like, water is essential to everything. And given that we live in a world where we can create meaning, yes, God's dead, right? Like, God's dead and stuff. You know, it happened. <laughs> and, but we can still create meaning. And it need not be a delusion. It can be based on, like, the scientific perfection of H2O, this fucking god molecule, the best molecule, it's so great. And it, it's the common denominator, you know, it's the common denominator, it connects us to everything, it flows through us, we sweat and we pee, it makes our neurons, you know, allowed to be wet, <laughs> and, and then when we get tired, and we, we've expended a lot of energy, we've danced, we can just take a big ol', you know, a big ol' sip of water. Cheers. Thank you, water. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we gotta do it anyway, so it's, it's like we might as well, you know, we might as well be conscious of it.
And that gratitude has a powerful effect. I, I've started noticing that it, ch it changes my habits. It makes me, I get, I get, I'm, I'm better hydrated these days for sure. I'm way better hydrated like than I used to be. And, um, we could do better with not having the plastic bottles. But oh, for sure. For sure. I have refilled that one. A dozen Constantly times. with yeah. mine too, but I'm then, missing the cap too. I, I spilled it on myself on the way here. <laughs> then, then, then it does leak the plastic in, into the water. Ooh, so, yikes. yeah. So, so we we can we can we can do better. But the entire idea of being grateful for water yes. is extremely important. Yeah, gratitude's powerful. Gratitude's very powerful for water for the shower, for so many other times that we can see the eight billion of us as water. Yes. And this is a really good co connecting thread across Generation Z uh, that even the millennials can get behind and try and push up to some of the people that are older than even us and potentially catalyze that massive movement to, ch to to get faster to unity, to unlock more of the creative potential in the minds, make the basic physiological needs met in yes. people. And I, I'm, I love that unifying thread. It's also, it's also something that, uh, like you said, that we can just be grateful for too. It's, it's a good one. It's, Absolutely. yeah, that, 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 that's a great narrative that I hope gets uh, embedded into. Um, the Great American Novel, but also into the movements that you inspire. Like we want to get behind the Great American Novel. We want to get behind water. Yeah. Like we love those two things, and I'm excited to continue, uh, you know, doing more of these conversations and hopefully engaging more people with what you're building. Thank yeah, you. yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm glad you're. I'm glad you're on board. It's. Uh, I think it's a very powerful thing. Um, Water is the ultimate symbol. It's the ultimate symbol. It's always been, you know, um, and I just want to use that. I want to use that. It's been there. It's not. It's not original with me. I'm just. I'm just. It's just passing through my, you know, semi-permeable membrane. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think that water religion has profound effects. Um, in, in *Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas*, there's this line uh, where he looks out from like the, you know, Sierra Nevada, or whatever. He's like looking out to the west, towards California, and he has this line. Where he's like, I can almost see the high water mark. The high water mark being like. This in the 60s, where when consciousness was being raised, like where the water, the floods of, of change, consciousness, like got to and then receded, you know, because that failed the idea of the failed movement. Um, so also talking about Generation Z, it's like blue generation, it's water generation, whatever you want to call it. Um, the idea of like the the floods coming. It, 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 I guess now I think about it, there's like a scary duality there because the floods are also like coming in a scary way, right? There's like actual floods, but also. But our flood to meet it, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll flood to meet the flood, I guess. Um, and also, I guess just like in a personal sense, um, not only do I associate the color blue and water with association, like I, I associate water, I use water as like a main mental structure for myself. It's a, it's a way I conceptualize things. Mm -hmm. we, we, you've, been, you've been using the word contours with me, and that's a way, mm -hmm. and I'm glad you picked up on that because that's like a way I think about things mm -hmm. through the contours, right? This idea of like ruts and reality flows through time. Because water, water has always been like a simple metaphor for time, for consciousness, the stream of consciousness, uh, for for history, right? For the progress of history, for for flows hitting one another, the stops and starts, the trickles, the, the, well, the causality. Um, also, water is so much. It's been here for billions of years, and it is just transcendent of human six million years of oh, yeah. civilization constructing and evolution so just just even that notion alone that 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 we can bond over something that transcends us like that yes yeah yeah it's powerful and it bonds it, you know water must they stick together but they also have that polarity to them uh, you you also they fill containers but they can also expand beyond those containers and they can harden to become containers themselves so i just to think of water as a tool for using that for thinking of ideas themselves and association itself the S the use of the word contours and ruts and old code yes, is another, to yeah, so water is like an OG code. It's an <laughs> original gangster code. You know, it's been there for so long. Day one, like, yeah. day, like day one, <laughs> right? And so if you think about it in terms of like, let's say day one being Big Bang, sure, it's not necessarily day one, but it is so far 
into uh, back before the evolution of humans. And so it's just that thinking about old code in that sense, what is the new code updates that we can make using metaphors, analogies that tie into the old code that is not the banking infrastructure, yeah. but, but that is water. Yes. And how can that awaken people to unity? So I, I, like, I like that a lot and where, where you're heading with that. Um, I want to hit on a couple other things on the way. We have to talk about the, the current era of the use of the technological oh, yeah. devices because they are both so incredibly connecting and in just able to access knowledge so well simultaneously it is causing a lot of issues. What are your thoughts, especially being 20 in the Cambridge area, yeah. Harvard, et cetera? What are your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, my thoughts are um, uh, that our, my phone is an extension of my body. Um, you know, there's like this little patch, my thigh right here, that's like on a hair trigger, ready for a vibration. Uh, and that's like a part of me, you know, when, I, when my phone's on my right pocket. Um, when I was on the road, the same thing, right? When I was on the road, it's like phone, right pocket, and then like uh, in pepper spray right pocket as well and then, and then wallet left pocket um, and not having it, it it being over there now during our filming um, I wasn't conscious of it before because I was like totally in you but now that like we brought up like now I'm like conscious that it's not here it's like an extension of our body it's an extension of our social minds primarily if we if, like I, I really see our minds that are the social world as the most important thing that's why social theory is so important to me because we are so much more social than we think we are we like to think that we're individuals you know, we have the ego or whatever. And we're not. We're, 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 we're our best friends. We're our parents. We're our sisters. Or we're our dance... Or we're, we're, we're sister ex de dance partner. You know, we're the dance partner for each of these people. The conglomeration of them all. And all of our thoughts... Because language structures our thought, and language is a social phenomenon that emerged from the need to understand one another, uh, according to Habermas, um, then, then, then our, all of these important high-level thoughts are in some way tied to our social brain. And so... Um, the the fact that like our phone can extend our social world, our consciousness, we can have like messenger in our pocket, is so powerful. But as you point out to me earlier, we when we were talking about my phone, um, it's we also have. And my friend Andrew Zuckerman uh, said this to me uh, last week, and he's very right. That we have like a Skinner box in our pockets. We're like we're we're putting ourselves we're putting ourselves in the clutches of everyone who wants to sell us something. We're putting us in the clutches of our worst, you know, addiction impulses. Um, people, people at companies know about human psychology. We growing up tend to not, you know, like we, so, so we need to be just aware and assume that all of these devices and all these things are trying to mold us to be convenient for them. You know, they have the psych, they, they have the psychometrics of 2 billion data human, points, human animals. Yeah. That. It's ridiculous. The power they have. And like, I, I, I consider myself someone who like, since I'm a young age, just care a lot about like, you know being a person in psychology, philosophy, just having a self, like taking it very seriously, like I, I have, I'm a person, I'm a human, this is, this is, this is wild, you know, this is, I'm gonna try to figure this out. Um, but most people don't. And so if my phone gives me that much trouble, you know, like can get me to, to Twitter uh, and get me, you know, jumping to see if uh, some stupid message came And out. how much less time are we spending on our creative actualization and oh, transcendence? Yeah. Oh, the, the, to, to absorb, there's like, on one hand, Memes, broadly understood, you know, like, in the way that Walt Whitman could be a meme, like, create us and like, they pass us and we, we can use them to synthesize. But it becomes, there becomes a point when it's no longer a productive thing, or a synthetic thing, but rather just a reproductive. Like, to watch The Office for the second... Anyone who's watched The Office more than once all the way through should totally reevaluate their lives. Like, you're not growing, you're not changing, you're absorbing, you know, you're just... It's comfort. The difference between... The difference between procreant effort, the when has that really urge and urge and urge, always the procreant urge of the world. To be aligned with the procreant urge of the world is one thing, but to have recreant comfort, right? To like recreate, to just be comfy, to listen to the song that you know rather than the new song that will challenge you. To, to and that, ha having a song stuck in your head is that power that wants to re that wants to relax, to not really think too hard, to like sit back on your laurels. Um, uh, that's a really powerful thing that we, uh, that I'm very worried about kids younger than me, uh, especially because like they likewise. Like, I, like I, I got my first phone at junior year of high school, 
so uh, which on one hand is world world historically new and significant, but on the other hand, compared to kids five years younger than me, it's wicked old. Um, and they, they also got phones and these internet devices that were way more developed and tailored to them with big money and big data for, for a decade. Whereas uh, me using the internet in my public library when I was younger, like, was different. Uh, but also the same, but also the same, you know, I'm not trying to mix binaries here, it's just these nuances, I guess. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, a powerful, it's a powerful tool and also can suck our life away. So I want to use it, I want to use it more optimally. Yeah, and more consciously, more optimally. When yeah, I'm on the road, it becomes more of a tool rather than like a part of my life. Yeah, so that's the that's the big one is that the access to an unlimited abundance of knowledge is so critical. Finding the signal in that knowledge for whatever one's fullest potential is is so critical. And yeah. and to be able to consciously use the tool for that purpose is is just so important. We got to change some of the the models that the corporations are using to uh, make money off of the attention economy. We've got to change some of that in advertising. Um, that's the new code. These are the new code deployments that's that have codes. to happen. What is one thing that every child should know going into the exponential technology age? <sighs> um, it, it, it's the historical sense, I think. The sense that you're, yeah, we're thrown into life, you know, we're existentially, um, and we're put into a narrative. The narrative has been going on for thousands of years, right? There's a whole story so far that's in your very molecules, in your bones. The, all of the powers and forces and narratives that have ever existed are in you and a part of you and, and can create you. However, you also do have the power as an individual to make actions in that story, to change the story, to add to it. And so I guess it's just sort of a, like there's this kind of paradoxical taking life seriously and not taking life too seriously. This sort of contradiction that everyone needs to really maintain in them. Uh, on one hand, taking life seriously, like, wow, what a blessing to live in this world. I need to learn everything about it because there's so much to learn. And every, of course, you don't learn everything, but if everyone learns something and a bunch of things and synthesizes them in different ways and becomes a unique individual, then even when all the parts collect into more, you know, more interactions, more syntheses, more holes, we just progress and get better faster and more wholesomely. We need people. We need people to be, like, to to have different ghosts in them, so that those different ghosts from the past can talk. Um, you know, the fact that the fact that um, like Zhuangzi couldn't talk to Nietzsche is a is fucked up because <laughs> because they both had similar ways of dealing with the past. Like like Zhuangzi and Nietzsche both dug into the history of their philosophical traditions and flipped them upside down and kind of like were radical things in similar ways. But they could never talk in real life. But in a young in a, in a young girl's mind who's watching this video at 16 who's interested in like freedom and like and, and perspectives and, and, and changing your way of viewing the world reading both those at the same time those two brilliant people can have a conversation with her in her head and be related and, and then as if they were living today and could re respect, re uh, react to today and that's just so important so I think everyone needs to self-cultivate more uh, and take their historical position seriously the fact that they are made of history but they also will be making the future in a very real sense, in a very like individual sense. And of course individually, each individual on one level doesn't have a lot of value relative to the whole. But I think that way of thing but but the little value that they do have is also an immense great value, depending on how you zoom. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I think uh, I think people zoom is a little off like, in the hollowness. Like a, we think we think that this world is like status quo. We think that we were born into just like generic life, let's figure figured out, you know, we're like post, the narrative ended, you know, when the Nazis died, you know what I mean? But that's, the narrative's not ended, we're still doing history, we're still, we have to take it really seriously. But also not too seriously in the sense that we can't believe everything around us and follow the cheese, follow the sort of obvious paths, follow the narratives that are given uh, exactly. So it's like that mixing of taking things seriously and not too seriously. Realizing the standing on the shoulders of giants, yes. the hundred billion humans before us that built civilization, tackling the biggest challenges that we have ahead of us, building the new codes. The relationship between memory and prophecy. Um, T.S. I've, I've been really obsessed with the Four Quartets lately, which is like T.S. Eliot's like big like masterpiece sort of final four poems. They're all meditations on time, and they're what got him the Nobel Prize. And they're like the crown of his lifetime's effort. And Little Gidding, the last one, is about fire and like time, and so the end of the cycle. 
there's been one of my favorite lines I've been like repeating in the shower like a mantra lately because it's been like, just driving me up the wall. It's, um, I'm gonna turn to the camera too, it's gonna be dramatic. <laughs> this is the use of memory for liberation. Not less of love, but expanding of love beyond desire, and so liberation from the future as well as the past. So this is the use of memory for liberation, for liberation. Like, we free ourselves, we, we don't free ourselves by living in a hollow present. Our present only comes full when we have a present with, with reference to the past, with hard won taking and absorbing of the past, and by putting it in relation to the future that we expect. If we expect to face these problems, or to, if we want to make a future this way, we, we need to take the materials we have and make it happen. We have all the materials, we just don't have them in an active sense. And we need to, we need to, we really desperately need to. And how about we do, are we in a simulation? Are we in a simulation? So that's a great question. Uh, I thought about it for a long time. I actually, um, uh, I, I know it's been like, uh, talked about a lot in recent years, but I remember when I was younger, I, I had like a similar thought that I entertained for a while, um, just in my sort of thinking about the world. Um, and, and on one level, it makes a lot of sense, right? Like as long as one reality gets, you know, far enough to start simulating realities, then most of the realities would be the simulated realities. Pretty much all of them. <laughs> but, but, but there's still that need for that one base. There's still the need for that one non-simulated reality, right? In order to start simulating realities. And thus I'm not caught up on everything that people have been talking about lately because I, I, you know, there might be other positions. But the way I've understood it is that like, you would still require some sort of organic you know, base reality to then simulate the rest. Um, and of course that might be limiting the conversation. But in that sense, I would say that like, why wouldn't we be the organic reality, if, 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 it, if, it, if it is still necessary. I also if it might, might be thinking about this totally wrong. This might be an issue that only a position outside of space and time in a way that we can't really understand uh, would, would, would need to be thought about in, in that sense. So in, in that sense, maybe maybe you know the progress of reality or realities or, or whatever is, you know, there's like a bell curve for every possibility as the smash goes outwards, right? And like in the sort of perfect mean reality where everything went according to that mean like maybe then that one simulates the rest simulates the other possibilities that could have happened in like a, not retroactively but sort of in a in sort of like a trunk you know branches sense i guess i'm rambling um i do do do, do we live in a simulation i think that i think that even if we don't we still kind of do but like i think that uh whatever reality could make all this craziness happen is like a simulation it's like a, you know it's it's, it's a it's 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 life is pretty ridiculous life is pretty wild and awesome and full of muchness and uh whatever it is i just want to absorb more of it and the last question is what is the most beautiful thing in the world oh definitely definitely people's eyes like your eyes, your pupils, and your irises. It, it, looking into people's eyes is like the past like six months been my favorite thing to do. Like favorite activity, best thing in the world. People's eyes, on one hand, right, they're all unique and beautiful on the irises, right? They have like you know, green, brown, blue, all these shades of colors within. Like everyone's eyes are like uniquely different. And that's like individuality, right? That's like the identity. The ident identity, like something that's been taken in. It's the being that all of your absorbed becomings so far has like left. Like it's like, this is you so far. It's the identity. But then the pupil is that like that yin, right? That subject that the, like you can see that they are a subjective being, that they are a fully valid like in to out star, you know, like in the pupil, in that darkness, in that sort of, where all the light gets absorbed. Um, so looking into people's eyes, the most beautiful thing ever, it commutes, uh, it communicates so much more than words in, in some senses. Um, it reminds us that we're not in a solipsistic world. I think Descartes was a big mistake, right? Like, <laughs> no, obviously Descartes great, and like Cartesian planes are cool, but solipsism is a big trap. It relates to sort of all of the West's biggest problems, like imperialism and like instrumental rationality, and not uh, understanding the world in like a other domination sort of sense. This visual culture from Marshall McLuhan, this idea that there's like this otherizing way of being. Um, Solipsism is a big mistake. We're all connected. We're all deeply in interconnected. We're all, you know, 
the, we're, we're a society, we're a species, we're, we're, we're humanity more than we are uh, individual humans in some senses. And I, I was reminded of that. And also falling in love. Like, so I, I love looking into your eyes, right? Because like, you're like an awesome friend, you're an awesome person. Uh, I love looking into strangers' eyes too. I, but then looking into the eyes of someone you like love and you've already been in their eyes before, it combines like that comfort and that newness. Uh, eyes just the most beautiful thing. Um, so I love people's eyes. I love, I just love looking at people's eyes. I love, I love sharing myself with them. I love that they can see me, and I love to like re- release like all my defenses to like look them in the eye to like show them like I'm here, I'm vulnerable, I'm yours, um, and I'm on your team. And I'm on your team, Alan. Of course, I'm on, I'm on our lovely audience's team. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, so eyes are the most beautiful thing in the world. Uh, I'm grateful that, for my sight. That was very eloquently described. Yeah, I love eyes as well. I'm really happy that that was the beautiful thing in the world for you. Thank you. Yeah, there's so much to unpack still about our conversation and in, in all of its nuance. There was so much good stuff that we discussed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you rocked it, Aiden. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, and I love you very much. I love, love you too, Alan. I love what you're building. I appreciate that. Yeah, we're going to rock it together. We're going to keep growing oh, yeah. Yeah, together, yeah, leveling up and, and building, co-creating. Um, there's yeah. this line where it's like, um, he, he, he goes up to a hill before dawn. He looks like the starry, the, the full packed heavens of stars. And he's like, and, and, and this is line, it's like, and my spirit said, when we become the enfolders of those orbs, and of the pleasure and knowledge uh, of everything within them. Will we be full and content then? Uh, and, then and then I answered, no, we will then lift and level to the next level to, uh, to absorb more. There's always like a greater, there's always, there's always more. Uh, Emerson has this essay called Circles. It's always, you can always draw a larger circle around each circle. That's an, a very essential piece of American thought is that idea of constant change, constant transcendence, constant yes. experimentation, constant encapsulating of a larger whole. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> That's so um, awesome. Yeah. Uh, sorry, one more thing, one more thing. Uh, this another Whitman line where he goes, um, now understand me well, it is provided in the essence of, uh, in the essence of things that from any fruition of success, from any fruition of success, no matter what, shall come forth something to make a greater struggle necessary. <laughs> So that's, yeah. that's what I want to leave. Um, that's yeah, it's so good. It, it's just the amount of synthesizing that you've been doing across the greatest thinkers and poets and novelists. It's just been outstanding and it's so evident in the way that you speak about history and the way that you speak about solving and tackling the challenges with things like yeah. the great American novel uh, as well as even the water as such a binding thing yeah. for us. and. I'm really grateful for you and I'm grateful for our ability to have an audience that has cared about the episode, what we talked about. Thanks audience. Everyone, I (laughs) urge you, I urge you, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Give us your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. I urge you to check out the great American novel. Check out what Aiden's work is, what he's doing. Check out the links in the bio to that. Have more conversations around you about the subjects that we talked about with your friends, your family, your coworkers, people on the internet. Just get conversing more about some of these great American ideas as well as about how we can put the new codes in that can tackle some of these greatest challenges. And support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support Simulation. Our links are below so you continue doing cool things like hopefully by 2020, building out the recording studio in Cambridge, our second one in addition to the one in San Francisco. And also go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace. Peace. (laughs) Nice. Good job. Thank you. Good job. That was so fire. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, glad. Yeah, you rocked it.